Hallo, ich bin heute auf Kantnagel und treffe mich mit David Wallace Wells. Der hat ein Buch geschrieben, Die unbewohnbare Erde. Und darin beschreibt er, wie in Zukunft unsere Welt aussehen könnte nach dem Klimawandel. Und zwar nicht nur, wie sich das auf unsere Ozeane, auf unsere Wälder, auf unsere, unser Wetter ähm, und so weiter, auf unsere Küstenlinien auswirkt, sondern eben auch, was es für unsere Politik, Kultur, Wirtschaft, ja überhaupt für unser normales Leben bedeutet. Ja, und ich bin schon ganz gespannt, Ihnen gleich meine Fragen zu stellen. So, first of all, thank you very much for taking the time. Oh, my pleasure. <laughs> and um, at the beginning of your book, you write that you are no environmentalist at all. So, how did you get involved with the issue of climate change at all? Mostly out of fear. Mm. I'm a journalist who, um, you know, reads a lot about the near future, is really interested in sort of um, the five and ten year time horizon and I was just seeing a lot of academic research that was first of all about climate change and then was much scarier about climate change than I had understood to be the broad conventional understanding. Um, it was much scarier than the stories that I was reading in other newspapers, seeing on TV programs, reading in other magazines and I felt that just as a journalist there was a there was a really big story to tell here about um, just how dramatic this crisis was, just how universal it was, how inescapable it was, um, and how much worse it could get than anybody had really been led to believe. Um, but at a personal level, I was also just terrified, and that pushed me to look deeper and deeper into the science. Unfortunately, the deeper I was, more or less the worse it looked. Mm -hmm. So um, I then spent the last couple of years trying to give that experience to readers um, in the way that I felt like I had been taken by the collar and really shaken by the facts of our scientific understanding about climate. I wanted to do the same to people who were like I had been a few years ago. And then I also wanted to think a bit about um, and write a bit about, you know, what it would mean to live on a planet like the one that we're imagining will be here in a few decades, not just in terms of what we can expect from um, extreme weather and heat and drought, but what it would mean to our politics and our geopolitics and our culture, our sense of our place in nature, our relationship to technology and to capitalism, to be living in a planet that was affected in all the ways we are now expecting it to be affected. And I think those impacts are perhaps as profound, maybe even more profound than some of the direct climate ones. And we've only just begun to start reckoning with um, what it would mean for all of us. Yeah. When are I uh, read your book, for instance. Sometimes I couldn't, could only read a couple of pages at once because it really made me so sad and despaired and yeah, frustrated. And yeah. And um, my question is, how do you deal with these negative feelings? Do you, uh, yeah, not get depressed? <laughs> well, I think um, I sometimes I'm depressed. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I'm angry. Sometimes I'm despairing. And um, you know, I think. Climate change is too big a story to process in any one way, and so we shouldn't be worried or, um, you know, we shouldn't be concerned if we are feeling some bad feelings um, as part of it. That's inevitable. It is, on some level, the only rational response to the crisis that we're uh, making for ourselves, the tragedy that we're all going to be living through and are already, in a lot of ways, living through. Um, but I also think that the best antidote to despair is progress. And personally, I think that talking openly about the science is useful in bringing about progress. And I think that when you look at what's happened over the last year, um, in the immediate aftermath of the UN's 1.5 degree report last October, which was really the first report like it to be quite urgent and forthright, and I would say honest about the science, um, in the immediate aftermath of that, We've had unprecedented political mobilization around climate really throughout the West. You know, a year ago before that report came out, I'd never heard of Greta Thunberg. Um, nobody else had either. Um, Extinction Rebellion hadn't started in the UK. In the US, we didn't have the Sunrise Movement. We didn't have Alexandria Ocasio Ortez Cortez elected. Um, and now we have, you know, a competition among Democratic candidates for who can be the most ambitious um, on climate. This is a, an entirely different political environment than was the case just a year ago. And I think um, for a long time it was understandable for people who really worried about climate to fall into despair because they saw so little happening. Mm. 
the last year has been a kind of a different message. We're still not moving nearly fast enough. Um, if we take the UN seriously and they say we need to have emissions by 2030, that really means, they would say, World War II scale mobilization starting this year, which we're not doing. And yet, by any political science standard, by any um, basic set of expectations that you might have from another area of political activism, the movement that we've seen is unprecedented. And I think in that way, sort of hope-giving. Mm. And the last thing I would say is that, um, you know, when I, when I think about, talk about, write about um, some of these really scary climate scenarios at, you know, at four degrees, if we have agriculture that's half as bountiful as it is today and twice as much war and a global GDP that's 30% smaller than it would be otherwise, that kind of thing. These impacts can seem so large that they can overwhelm you, they can feel overwhelming. But ultimately they're a reflection of how much power we have over the climate because we're not going to get to those points unless we make a specific set of choices that continue warming, continue producing emissions and make things worse. This is not a story that's happening outside of our control. It's happening because what we are doing collectively as a species. And that means that, theoretically at least, we can make a different set of choices and bring about a different future. Now, there are a huge number of obstacles to that. There's, you know, we've made very little progress over the last decades. I don't mean to sound like a sunny optimist. I think things are going to get worse and there's going to be considerably more suffering in the world because of climate change than there's ever been before in human history. But it's also the case that that doesn't mean that we have to give up. Um, we are, you know, this is a system that is not binary, it's a spectrum. And at every level, even if we're at two degrees, even if we're at three degrees, at four degrees, um, we'll still have the opportunity to avert some amount of future warming and save our fellow humans from some amount of future suffering. And I think that that is, um, that's the sort of challenge that we have before us. And I think we have to pick it up to take action, even in the face, even knowing that we're likely only to have um, sort of measured, limited success. I think we still need to be fighting because every little bit of warming that we can avoid, we'll all be better off. So at the end of the day, are you optimistic? I think it depends on, on your set of expectations. Yeah. So if you're basing your expectations on what the world looks like today, what the climate looks like today, I don't think there's any hope that that's going to continue. I think that we're going to get considerably warmer I think probably if the world was run, run by a single autocrat who was single-mindedly focused on climate, probably we could engineer a, a revolution that would allow us to stay just below two degrees. I think that's like absolute best case scenario. But since we live in a very different world than that, I think we're going to get considerably more warming still. So we're going to be north of two degrees, which is, um, scientists call it the threshold of catastrophe. Um, and in that sense, you know, we're going to be living through a lot more suffering. Um, and you could say that I'm pessimistic. On the other hand, I think it's the rational, reasonable um, way to look, not about where the world is today, but the track we're on. And if you look at the path we're on today, where that would take us by the end of the century, it's north of four degrees, which would mean, you know, $600 trillion in climate damages. So double all the wealth that exists in the world today would be um, impacted, damaged by climate change. Um, we would have, um, refugee crises and the hundreds of millions. We would have whole parts of the middle of the um, planet that would be literally uninhabitable. And I think we're going to do quite a lot to avoid that level of warming. I think we'll stay below four degrees this century. And if you so if you base your expectations on where we are now, I think we'll do a lot um, that will allow us to be better off. And so from that perspective, I'm optimistic. But, you know, the truth is we're in a really ugly situation with climate. There's no avoiding some quite dramatic amount of suffering, perhaps even unprecedented amount of suffering. In a couple of days I talked to a colleague and I asked her, what do you think about climate change? And she's a really good journalist as a, and a, at a renowned magazine and she said, well, that doesn't make me sleep bad, that's just uh, exaggerated. That isn't as badly as people say, some people say. What do you apply to those people? Well, I would say a few things. The first is that you know the planet's um, 1.1 degrees warmer than it would be than it, than it was before industrialization now, and that doesn't sound like very much, but it puts us already out entirely outside the window of temperatures that enclose all of human history. So the human animal evolved under climate conditions that no longer prevail. 
We developed agriculture and civilization and modern civilization under climate conditions that no longer prevail. It's almost as though we've landed on a new planet with a different set of climate conditions and we have to figure out what of the civilization that we've brought with us can endure and survive in these conditions and what about that civilization we need to remodel and reform to allow us to live in this new environment, um, which is going to change considerably more. So we're at 1.1 degrees now, which is, again, hotter than it's ever been in all of human history. But we're going to get at least twice as warm, maybe three times as warm, possibly four times as warm this century. And what that means is really quite dramatic at just two degrees, which I think is inevitable. Many of the biggest cities in South Asia and the Middle East will be unlivably hot in summer. That means you won't be able to go outside during summer without risking heat stroke or death, which would mean some of these are cities that have 10 or 12 or 15 million people in them. And it's one reason why the UN expects that just by 2050, at about two degrees, we're gonna have as many as 200 million or more climate refugees. Um, just north of two degrees, we would have the permanent loss of all ice sheets, both Arctic and Antarctic, that would unfold over centuries. But it would mean probably about 80 meters of sea level rise, which would be enough to drown two thirds of the world's major cities. Um, and I would say that's an inevitable amount of warming. Um, so there are some quite, quite dramatic impacts coming right down the road. They're right on the other, you know, right a few years from now. But I also think humans are adaptable, they're responsive, and there, while there will be an enormous amount of additional suffering, I also think we will normalize that amount of suffering. We will find ways to live among it, partly through denial, partly through compartmentalization, partly by defining the suffering of people who live elsewhere as not as important to our lives as we might think they would be. All of those are indictments of us as creatures, but I also think there is some truth to an intuition that life in some, in some recognizable form will go on despite some of these quite dramatic impacts. Um, but what I try to write about in my book is that this is not a matter of either or. It's not like it's, if civilization doesn't collapse, then everything's going to be okay. I think the very likely outcome is that we have a civilization that looks in a lot of ways like the one that we have today but in other ways is quite dramatically reshaped, and especially as regards to our expectations for what the future holds, or our understanding of our place in nature, um, our relationship to technology, what we think of capitalism and all that kind of stuff, could be quite, quite profoundly shaken um, by these changes, which are basically inevitable. And I think it's one of the reasons why it's so important to look um, somewhat far down the road and think about what the world would be like in 20 or 30 or 40 years, that we have this, um, such a, a powerful reflex for normalizing, um, and that if we're only worrying about what life would be like in 2030, in the year 2029, we're probably not gonna worry all that much about it because we will have already basically adjusted to 2029. But even looking at that year from today, from the vantage of 2019, we can see that it's gonna contain an unconscionable amount of suffering and that means that we should respond to that by doing whatever we can to avoid that amount of warming. Um, the closer we get to some of these um, impacts and some of these thresholds, the more we'll be able to say to ourselves, ah, it's not so bad, we'll survive. And I think we should be, um, there's some human wisdom in that. We will survive, although a lot of people will die, many won't. Um, but there's also some, some real moral wisdom in taking the long view because it can motivate you um, out of uh, horror at the kind of world that is possible a decade or two down the road in a way that you wouldn't be horrified staring at that scenario just one year down the road. So one problem or maybe an open question for people like me is what can I do? I mean it feels like I'm an individual in a system that's overwhelming and I I'm not sure if, I mean, if I, I change my consumption, that doesn't really make any difference. So what would be your call or your, your advice? What can I do? Well, thankfully, you live in a society that is responsive to political um, changes in the political dynamic of the public. Mm -hmm. And that means that, for me, the most important thing that you can do is vote and be active beyond voting in trying to hold leaders accountable to commitments on climate change that they may have made um, when campaigning or to make them intensify those commitments once they're in office. Um, because we really do need systemic change at a policy level 
and at a global level um, in order to respond to this crisis with anything like the scale that it demands. Now, I think individuals, if they feel motivated to change their own lifestyle patterns to reduce their carbon footprint, they should because people should live in accordance with their own values. It's also useful in a way of, as a way of signaling to those around them that they're concerned about this issue and instigating conversations about climate change. That's important because many, many people the polls show carry anxiety about climate change with them and don't talk about it very often with even their loved ones. And talking about it is a kind of political act too. It brings that, that anxiety into a kind of public com, you know, communicative sphere. It's also helpful in signaling to politicians that we can live fulfilling lives and still live responsibly when it comes to climate and hopefully inspiring them to take more aggressive action as a result. But ultimately, we need that action, policy action, to make any meaningful dent in this crisis. And what an individual can do through politics, therefore, I think, is much more important than what they can do in the consumer choices they make and the lifestyle decisions they, they make. Um, and, you know, I think, I think about that when I think about diet, which we hear a lot about, you know, um, red meat is a meaningful contributor to the agricultural carbon footprint. Um, but if you were to legislate that all cattle farmers had to feed their cows seaweed, their methane emissions would fall by as much as 95 or 99 percent. You could also legislate, reg regulate the way that they graze those cattle to turn those farms into what are called carbon sink, carbon sources which produce carbon into carbon sinks which absorb them. These are practices we know work now but are not being practiced at scale and we can legislate them reg and regulate those farmers so that they are. That seems to me to be a much more plausible approach to the problem of beef's carbon footprint than trying to inspire the entire world, all eight billion of us, to give up meat at once. Um, similar with um, air travel, which is another thing that you hear about in a country like Germany or the, a country like the US. You know, globally, actually, air travel isn't such a big part of the problem. It's just about 2% of global emissions. But for people in the wealthy West, it's a much bigger chunk of their carbon share. And that's a problem. But unless you can imagine literally everybody on the entire planet giving up um, air travel entirely, what we really need is a new technology that will allow transportation like this, probably in planes like the ones we have, but planes that are flying on zero carbon fuel and therefore not producing emissions. Now, it would take an immensely large public boycott to generate um, you know, research and development spending that would produce that. But it wouldn't take that much um, through politics and policy mm -hmm. to try to bring that about. And that, I think, is really, um, the, those are the levers that we can pull most effectively, um, collectively. But it's also the levers that we can, those are the levers that we can pull most effectively individually in trying to bring about some kind of political change and really refocus the priorities of our political leaders on climate, which is not just one climate issue among many, but the, the system in which all other political issues unfold and the system, the theater in which all of our lives are unfolding. So when it is distorted and damaged and degraded, all of our lives will suffer and all of our political hopes for other, on other fronts will suffer as well. That's why I think we really need to make this a first order, top shelf political priority, almost as though it governs all of the other um, hopes that we have for politics because on some level it does. Mm -hmm.